All right, so we're now going to be going on to the chapter on uh, diastereoselectivity. Uh, and uh, as, a, as by way of introduction to this, I, I want to just cover two uh, important concepts, the idea of reactions that are stereospecific and reactions which are stereoselective. In, in fact, a lot of the reactions we've been looking at uh, so far have been stereoselective reactions. In other words, in the reaction, there are actually two possible diastereomers that might form or enantiomers. Uh, and in that case, what we're seeing is a major versus a minor product coming out of the reaction. Uh, however, stereospecific reactions are one where there is only one possible uh, a, a diastereomer or product that would form, uh, the other one is impossible. And because of that, uh, the reaction is specific. Uh, now, uh, you know quite a few examples of stereospecific reactions. An SN2 reaction is an example of that. And an E2 reaction, an elimination reaction, is also an example of a stereospecific reaction. It's because of the way the reaction has to go. So I, th I think what I want to do is I want to just uh, give an example of uh, these types of reactions, just uh, uh, so we can look at those and, and make sure we uh, just understand some of those basics. It's a recap of the work that you've already done. So if I had to take um, this uh, styrene derivative over here, methyl styrene, uh, and I had to epoxidize it, in other words, put an epoxide on. If I'm going to oxidize it, the reagent that I'd probably choose to use is MCPBA, so organic soluble uh, oxidizing agent, metachloropurbenzoic acid. Usually I do this in DCM and uh, keep it on ice at zero degrees Celsius. All right, so that's going to form the epoxide, and this reaction is stereospecific because we do not form any of this epoxide where the oxygen is coming up and it's going down uh, over there. This is not formed at all. It's impossible for this one, this diastereomer compared to that, to have formed uh, because of the way this reaction occurs with the oxygen that's added to one face of this double bond at one time. And of course it can add from either the top face, which I've shown over here, or the bottom face. There's no control over that. So actually this is racemic over here and then this one doesn't form at all. All right, so that's an example of a stereospecific reaction, epoxidation. Uh, we could then uh, open this uh, epoxide, uh, and we could open it up to, say, uh, let me get this right here, this alcohol. Uh, have I done that correctly? Uh, let's assign the chirality over here. One, two, three, the H's at the back over here, so this is uh, S. Uh, one, uh, two, three, uh, looks like R, but the H is coming to the front, so it is correct. Um, all right, so opening up this epoxide, uh, perhaps uh, you would have suggested something like lithium aluminium hydride to have done that. That's not very efficient because the aluminium hydride could attack from both sides. Uh, but actually what works very well is if you just take hydrogen and then uh, palladium on carbon is very good at breaking benzylic uh, heteroatom bonds. So this is the benzylic position. Uh, we've got an oxygen over there, so the hydrogenation will cleave that selectively and we'll get a very good yield of, of this product over, over there. Anyway, that's by the by, uh, because I want to show a substitution reaction. I can't do it on an OH, so how do we change an OH into something which is a good leaving group? Uh, changing it into a chlorine or bromine or uh, possible. Uh, a lot easier in the synthetic laboratories is to use tozyl chloride. If you don't know what tozyl chloride is, you need to go and look that up. Uh, and we would use a weak base. It could be triethylamine, or it might have been um, uh, pyridine uh, is good. And uh, the solvent would also have been dichloromethane. And our product would now be the tozylate of this OH group, which is still have the same uh, stereochemistry. So this is now a good leaving group. And now when I treat it with a good nucleophile, for instance, such as um, uh, methylamine, all right, uh, just 
you know, um, methylamine, amines are very good nucleophiles. So when we do a substitution reaction on this, this goes via an inversion of stereochemistry. And so the product would look like this. <clears throat> and let's just do a workup at the end. So step one, step two, just to remove that extra proton that's on over there. Uh, we just uh, wash it with uh, aqueous um, sodium bicarb. Okay, uh, and then we get the CH3 over there. All right, so we've done a substitution reaction. It's an inversion of stereochemistry. It's SN2. It has to be an inversion because the nucleophile, as it comes in, it must come in from behind the leaving group, all right? And you get an inversion of the stereochemistry. And then we, uh, well, uh, we make this compound over here, which is a uh, uh, tuck. Please don't make this compound. Um, okay, so that's a, a, an example of a substitution reaction, SN2, which is stereospecific. Okay, we are because it has to be an inversion of the, the stereochemistry. All right, so let's just look at a, a remind you of elimination reactions. Uh, and so, uh, elimination reaction, we must have a leaving group. I'm going to put a chiral scent on this bromine. Uh, and we need to have something else. I'll put a phenyl over there. I'll put a T-butyl over here, and over here we'll just stick a methyl group. Okay. All right, so elimination reactions, uh, in order to do that, we need to use a very strong base, uh, and we'll, whenever we do something like that, we're going to start with bases that are O minuses. Uh, and for elimination to occur, if we want to act as a base, uh, O minus is good, but it's it's nicer and better to use like a bulky uh, uh, base. Uh, we could also have used the stronger ones, LDA, which we've covered before, etc., etc. But this is great for elimination. Ethoxide would have also uh, possibly worked. Uh, but the key point here is that what's happening is the proton is picked up, and we kick in over here. And kick out that way and so we end up with a double bond um, and this is where we have to now check things because uh, although this is a methyl group there uh, although just by looking at this by inspection this is probably going to be the correct product uh, to to really work this out we have to remember that the proton and the bromine have to be anti periplanar to each other uh, in order to eliminate okay this is so that the orbitals can overlap they've got to be on, on opposite carbons, they actually have to be anti I don't know, they kind of show you this, it's difficult, I don't have models with me at the moment. Um, but they've got to be on opposite sides so that they can overlap. Uh, and in order to do that, to check this out, um, this structure I've drawn over here is kind of cheating a little bit because the proton is below, is on the bottom side and the, pro uh, the bromine is on the top face, so they are already like that. So this is going to be this final product. But we should do this using uh, Newman projections. I find that this is the easiest one to do. And you need to know how to do Newman projections. It's going to be important in uh, one of the models that we have to look at in this chapter. So we're going to look down this carbon-carbon bond over here and remind you of the Newman projection. So as we're looking at this, um, this phenyl is going to be coming uh, straight down uh, like that. Uh, and then we're going to have a cyclic, this is the the hypothetical uh, carbon that's behind the front carbon. This is our front carbon over here. This over here we represent with this big circle over there. And the T-butyl group is going straight up uh, like that. Uh, so, so down that carbon over there, phenyl group in the plane. This is the plane of the paper that's over here. Okay, You see now that's the plane of the paper. We've just turned everything. So if that's the plane of the paper, the bromine uh, is sitting on this side over here. And the proton is sitting on that side over there. And then behind, the methyl group is sitting over here. And the proton is sitting over there. Okay, so um, hopefully you remember that from, from last year. Uh, and then the important thing here is that this confirmation that has been drawn out, our first one, just as a from, from this structure over here, shows that this proton over here is already anti-periplanar to this bromine. So the proton at the back over here 
is antiperiplanar to this bromine, which is on the front carbon. And so when the base comes in, it can pick up this. This goes in to form that double bond that's kind of between this carbon and the one at the back. It's difficult to draw because it's flat. And then this will come out. And because of that, the double bond which is forming here, my pencil is, right? Uh, we're going to have this... Um, this was the phenyl, left it out, naughty me. We're going to have this phenyl and the methyl on the same side as the proton and the t-butyl on the other side. So uh, the phenyl and the methyl on the same side of the double bond, and this proton that's here is on the same side as the t-butyl. So we worked out the stereochemistry of the product correctly using the Newman projection. And, and you should always do this when you get an E2 elimination. Okay, So make sure that you're able to do it. So this is another example of a reaction which is stereo specific so the formation of an epoxide all right is a stereo specific reaction uh, the uh, opening of epoxides are normally stereo specific reactions if if we had added a nucleophile to this it must also come in from below where the epoxide is opening up all right just like an sn2 reaction and then an sn2 reaction is stereo specific e2 reactions are stereo specific um, and uh, those are all that I'm going to use in this example now. Uh, but if uh, stereospecific reactions have everything to do with the way the reaction occurs, means that the orbitals themselves can only react in one particular way, and and that's only all we get. They don't. You don't get a mixture in an E2 reaction. You don't get a mixture of these uh, of the double bond over here, the EZ. Uh, and in a substitution reaction, an SN2 reaction, you don't get a mixture of uh, where uh, you're getting a, a racemic mixture being formed. If the if you're starting with one enantiomer, the product is also another is is the opposite chiral center, but it's still uh, a, a pure enantiomer. All right, I hope that made some sense.